Hello, welcome to the Entrepreneurs Network. I'm Rick Anthony. One of the lessons I've learned in the 25 plus years that I've been an angel investor and entrepreneur is that entrepreneurship isn't confined to just the traditional business environment, nuts and bolts uh, of uh, business or technology. Uh, in fact, if it weren't for entrepreneurs in the arts, we probably wouldn't have very much art, either the performing arts, film, dance, any of the things that it helped to enrich our daily lives. Regardless of where the desire originates, uh, entrepreneurship is just about everywhere, but especially in the arts. My guest today is an entrepreneur of the performing arts, more specifically dance, even more specifically ballet. At 15, Christina Puccini was invited to join the Boston Ballet, the fourth largest ballet company in the country and one of the most prestigious at the time she was the youngest member of the professional uh, company. Christina went on to win several awards in this country and in other parts of the world for her virtuosity and performed on stages in the U.S., in Europe, and in Asia. She's won a long list of awards that she'll be telling us about. So welcome, Christina Pulcini, to the Entrepreneurs Network. Thank you for having me, Rick. An entrepreneur uh, extraordinary in ballet, a world-class ballerina, and owner and operator of KP Ballet Academy That's in right. Havertown. That's right. Yes. All right, that's enough of the commercial stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the warm As introduction. As we always do, what's your background? How did you get into ballet? And, and how did you get on this journey that has led to your storied career as a world-class ballerina? Well, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Grew up in the Philadelphia area, mm -hmm. so this is home for me. And when I was a little girl, I started dancing pretty young, at about three or four years old. Yeah. My parents enrolled me in ballet classes, just traditional classes. Right, just to get you out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, and I continued to dance like many little girls do. Yes. And then it wasn't until I was about nine years old that I absolutely fell in love with the art form. I had the opportunity to perform with the Pennsylvania Ballet's Nutcracker at age nine. Mm -hmm. And I was the trumpeter in the battle scene and that was the first time i stepped on stage i felt the the bright stage lights mm -hmm. the warm audience the music the costumes and that was when i fell in love with the art form it was just a magical moment for me and s only six years later you were at boston with the boston ballet amazingly enough only six years later i was with the boston ballet i pretty much knew at that moment after i had gotten on stage and been a part of a real ballet yeah. production that that's what I wanted to do. I think it was just really magical. <laughs> but but what, I mean, um, we'll get into what it takes to become a ballerina. But what special gifts do you feel you have that you were able to use to develop, to perfect, to become a world class ballerina? It's more than just well, a love of the art. It is more than just a love of the art. And Rick, I think there are a few things. First there needs to be some sort of God-given facility. Mm -hmm. It's like certain people are born to be football players, mm -hmm. golfers, figure skaters. You need that facility. Mm -hmm. But amazingly enough, a lot of people have the physical ability to become a ballerina. I marvel at that because I work with about 300 young dancers and mm -hmm. there's so much physical mm -hmm. ability and talent. But in terms of what it takes to become a professional ballerina, it's no different than what they say about how to get to Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. It's just practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice. It's about starting young. It's about getting a good foundation, having excellent mm. teachers, coaches, and then just hard work, dedication, and a lot of sacrifice. Yes, not only on your part, but I guess your parents, because yours is a, a family story. Absolutely. Your, your parents have been with you every step of the way. I had tremendous support from my parents, from the moment I told them that it was my dream, right. they did everything they could to support me. And uh, that involved not only paying for lessons, but moving around the country and mm -hmm. getting the coaching I needed. And for, for the longest time, I knew nothing about ballet. I'm, I'm a, an opera buff myself. But ballet, it seemed to me, well, I, I just couldn't get into it and, until I started to learn more about it. And what particularly amazed me with not only female ballerinas, obviously, but male dancers. How do they do that? They leap into the air and they seem to be suspended in air. 
and the grace, uh, they seem to defy gravity. Is, is that a gift or is that technique or is, is the answer yes? It's both technique and a gift to be able to do that. It is both technique and a gift to be able to do that. Male dancers are known for their grand allegro, that's what it's called, yes. those big soaring leaps yes. that you see. Mm -hmm. And where they they see <laughs> the, the twist in there. Yeah. Exactly. It's really amazing to watch, especially up close, the strength that is required. But like you said, it's a gift and also a lot of training and hard work. Yes. It's similar to being an Olympic athlete. Well, what well goes that was into the point. I, I didn't have an appreciation of the uh, uh, athleticism the physical strength, the stamina it takes yes. to do that stuff and, and to have the stamina to do a, an entire performance. It takes a lot of stamina yes. and like I was saying, it really involves years of training and hard work yeah. and sacrifice. Th this is a very pedestrian question, but w what, what's the origin of the tutu? Rick, that is one of the most important questions for little <laughs> girls. <laughs> I mean, when you start <coughs> ballet, it's all about wanting to get that tutu <coughs> on. We, we bought them for our little, for our daughter when she was uh, dancing and for our grandkids and so on. Mm -hmm. And I know you go into a store that sells this kind of paraphernalia. Yes. And they've got a wall covered and racks filled with, with the little flimsy things, tutus, <laughs> in all different colors and, uh, and so on. What is a tutu and why? Well, actually... Italian ballerinas first came up with the idea of the tutu. Mm -hmm. Leave it to Italians and their clothing design. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the tutu is to show off the ballerina's leg work and footwork. And so they've evolved over time. There are different kinds of tutus, mm -hmm. but the real purpose is to show off the ballerina's so legs and feet. So what is it that the, the male dancer wears? It looks like a tutu, but it's not a tutu. Male dancers do not wear a tutu. They are only for the yes. ladies. And they wear what is called a tunic. A tunic. Up top. And uh -huh. it's all about the tutu, and, and I think. And the shoes <laughs> themselves. What are they made of? Point shoes? Yes. Point shoes. Point, 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 I think it is. The French? I'm so glad you took P -O -I -N -T -E, French. I didn't. P-O-I-N-T-E, point shoes? Yes, okay. P-O-I-N-T-E, -E, point yes. shoes. Yes, point shoes enable ballerinas to mm. rise up and, in fact, dance on the tips of their toes. And point shoes are made of glue and cardboard. Mm -hmm. They're not made of wood, as mm -hmm. many people think. And, in fact, they're more comfortable than people think they are. Really? They really are rather comfortable to dance and it was my favorite part of ballet when I was able uh -huh. to get my point shoes and start to twirl around uh, the stage. Are there, are there different shoes for male and female dancers? There are. Ballerinas wear point shoes. Male dancers wear what we call ballet slippers. It's like a slipper. Soft slippers, yeah. yes. Yeah. So. Uh, did, I'm sure you've seen and seen again and again red, is it called red shoes? No, red, what was the movie? Yes. The red, the, the, the red shoes, The red shoes, it? yes, yeah. you're right. Um, you saw that movie. I did many years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, it, well they, they, this station plays it from time to time, and it's been run again and again and again. But again, some of the, the, the choreography, uh, uh, Mik Mikhail, what's his last name? Barishnikov. Barishnikov. Didn't he popularize ballet, at least in this country? He popularized ballet, not only in, in the United States, yes. but across the world. Mm -hmm. And Rick, since you brought off Barishnikov, let me yes. just share a quick story about my personal encounter yes. with Barishnikov. When I was training in New York City, I had a coach, Elena Chernyshova, and Elena was Barishnikov's ballet mistress when he was the artistic director of American Ballet Theater mm -hmm. in New York. And Elena really wanted me to meet Barishnikov, so she arranged to have me and my parents go to Barishnikov's restaurant in New York. It was called Samovar at I the time. Had a restaurant, yeah. I don't know if it's still there, uh -huh. but she arranged for me to be taken to the second floor to Barishnikov's private dining room to meet him, mm -hmm. which I did. And I was 14 at the time. I was completely awestruck. I think uh, you said I'm you're sure. an opera buff. It yes. would probably be like meeting Pavarotti yes. for you. So that was a really special moment for me. Is, do you have, uh, is there a role model for you? A, a a ballerina who, in your opinion, represents the epitome, the apex. Is there a single ballerina? I cannot say there's a single ballerina. No? For me, there are so many 
exquisite ballerinas out mm -hmm. there. And I look up to so many of them. Growing up, there was one ballerina who performed at American Ballet Theater in mm -hmm. New York, and her name is Susan Jaffe. And she was my favorite ballerina mm -hmm. growing up. I was able to go and to the Met and see her perform. Mm -hmm. My parents, once again, were so supportive and took me there all the time. And I just loved watching her. Yeah, you mentioned Pavarotti. So if, if Pavarotti could deliver his interpretation of an aria or something, but his interpretation of the music, can a ballerina uh, give her interpretation of a, a piece of music or a particular storyline? Uh, that's a great question, Rick. That's absolutely the case. When you look at ballerinas, there are so many special gifts that yeah. they have. and. If you go to a ballet company and just look around at all the different ballerinas, mm -hmm. you can see some are really strong turners, some are strong jumpers, some have beautiful arms, mm -hmm. some are strong actresses, and everyone brings their own personal touch and personality mm -hmm. to a role. And every once in a while, a ballerina comes along who has the whole package, yeah. which is rare, but when that happens, it's very exciting to mm. watch. Mm. Yeah. What's the toughest part? What has been the toughest part of uh, y your journey? Uh, you've won so many awards. Uh, I, th I think when you were a younger person, not that you're old now, uh, you won the gold and silver, was it a Grand Prix of I ballet? I did. I did. There's a Where is that competition? That competition, the Youth America Grand Prix, is the largest student scholarship competition in the world. Mm -hmm. and. When I arrived at Boston Ballet, the artistic director said to me, you need to go do that competition. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was very nervous. <laughs> it's essentially like the Olympics of ballet. So mm -hmm. it required a lot of training and coaching. And the way it works is they have national competitions all over mm -hmm. the United States and abroad. So I competed in a competition in Boston and won the gold medal there. And from there was invited into what they call the Grand Prix Finals in New York City. Mm -hmm. And was able to compete in New York and won the Grand Prix silver medal mm -hmm. there. And that was a real turning point in my career. I was 16 at the time. Today you own and operate the KP Ballet Academy. Yes. Christina Puccini Ballet Academy. Yes. Uh, how long have you had that business? Why did you decide to open the business? Uh, I introduced you as a, an entrepreneur in the arts. Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Well, I opened... A, a risk taker? I opened KP Ballet Academy in 2009 after a few years of planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. So it wasn't that uncommon for me to be mm -hmm. thinking about doing something like that or for my parents to sanction it. My father's an entrepreneur. But even so, Rick, when I opened in 2009, I considered myself a ballet teacher mm -hmm. and a ballerina. And it wasn't until a few years in that I started to think of myself as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And that was largely due to being exposed to ideas like strategy, positioning, designing your future, innovation, and now I realize what a risk it is to mm -hmm. have yes. a business and strive to create value that nobody else can offer or mm -hmm. an experience for dancers that is unique. So, What's the toughest part of operating and owning your own business? Oh, my Rick, let me think about that. There are... We have to pay bills. <laughs> So, so you absolutely, need absolutely. You need resources, I mean, capital, and you probably know more about yeah. this than I do. <laughs> is it scalable? You have one location now, is that right? Mm -hmm. And about 300 students? Yes. On, on an ongoing basis? There are 300 students. Okay, is, do you have a business plan that says there will be a second location, either in this market or another market? Is, the, is there, a, and I don't know the answer, so I'm making this up. Mm -hmm. Is there a business plan that says, I, I want to bring in a partner so that I, we can scale, because I can only do so much myself? Uh, are you thinking along those lines now? I seriously considered this year a secondary location mm -hmm. and gave it a lot of thought. <clears throat> but at the, the end of the day, realized that I want to be able to touch every student I have mm -hmm. and to get to know every student. <coughs> so that's, that's the, an entrepreneur's mistake. 
<laughs> to have multiple locations yeah. would mean that I am not able to be there. You run the risk of diluting the brand. Exactly. Right. So although that was appealing, I decided I'd rather have the 300 students I have and I, I want to know every dancer's name. Mm -hmm. I want them to know me. I want to create an environment that's inspiring and creative and that was just the best decision for me. But mm -hmm. in terms of growth, I do see a lot of areas for growth in the academy mm -hmm. just by continuing to offer classical ballet training mm -hmm. and performing opportunities rooted in classical ballet. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the brand, I really see three brands under the umbrella. Oh. The first one is the Ballet Academy, which we've been talking about. Right. But then there's also Delaware Valley Ballet Theater, DVBT for short. Mm -hmm. And that is our company, eligible middle school and high school aged dancers in our school can funnel into the company. And that's really all about offering them those magical moments that I was mm -hmm. talking about having as a young girl in the Nutcracker. And I'm really excited about growing DVBT into is a regional a, powerhouse. Is that a venue? Is that a, th a theater, a physical theater? That is a... Or will it be? We do perform okay. in a physical theater. That's actually a performing group within our mm -hmm. school for my students. Oh, okay. All right. And we do bring in some professional dancers as well because mm -hmm. that's always inspirational. But then there's a third brand brewing right now uh, called Delaware Valley Ballet Contemporary. And that's going to be designed for ballerinas who have a different approach, who lean more towards the neoclassical and contemporary art form of ballet, mm -hmm. which is fabulous and a lot of fun. And once again, that will be all about offering dancers those magical moments. So mm -hmm. I see areas and opportunities for mm -hmm. growth in all three of those places. Is, is West Side Story uh, a ballet? Well, contemporary ballet? Uh, it, it came to mind as you were describing the different types. Jerome Robbins was the choreographer, mm -hmm. and he, in fact, was a choreographer who worked very closely with George Balanchine at the New York City Ballet. Mm -hmm. And, Rick, that's a wonderful example of what you can do with the art form of ballet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be Swan Lake and the Nutcracker right. and Giselle, which are exquisite and beautiful and so pure. But you can also take the art form and do so many innovative and creative mm -hmm. things like Jerome Robbins did. So it's not technically a ballet, but there are so yeah. many opportunities yes. for things like that. Are you still performing? I am not. My cup is full after, really? after seven years of traveling the world uh -huh. and performing all over the world. I decided that now it's about my students and giving them those same magical moments you that I had. It? You must miss it. I don't miss Maybe performing. No. I no, don't miss really. performing, although I love ballet so much. It's something that always mm -hmm. I want to be part of my life. And so you've hung up your tutu. I've hung up my tutu, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I give them to the, the girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you have only little girls, uh, I guess up to teenagers, in your academy, no boys? Do you teach only ballet or do you teach... Uh, uh, what do you call that? Tap and other forms of dance. Our specialty is ballet. Just ballet. Just coming from my background right. and experience, I decided that I wanted to exclusively teach mm -hmm. ballet. And we do have all girls right now. What mm -hmm. I do is for our performances that I've mm -hmm. talked about, I hire professional male dancers from mm -hmm. ballet companies locally, mm -hmm. and they come in to mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. our ballerinas. It must be awfully difficult, well, I don't know this, but for a professional dancer to make a living. And um, I was on the board of the Walnut Street Theater for five years. I love the Walnut Street and Theater. Yeah, and they, they, they do a great job on the main stage as well as the, uh, the smaller stages. But when those dancers come in, uh, uh, some of them obviously have been trained in classical ballet. You yes. can just tell from the moves. Yes. The men and the, the, uh, the women, the females. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. No problem. Um, I, 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 is it difficult for someone who's trying to make his or her living in dance to move from different forms, classical ballet, and then to something like uh, a show, uh, a, a big production? Well, that's am, am another. I making myself clear? That's I, another great yeah. question. You are. Ballet is the foundation <coughs> for all mm. forms of dance. 
So when you look at Broadway dancers yes. or even <coughs> modern dancers, jazz dancers, you'll notice that almost every one of them started mm -hmm. in classical ballet. Mm -hmm. It's just the foundation for all dance. So even if you know you want to, for example, go on Broadway <coughs> and or perform in West Side Story, mm -hmm. it would be important to study ballet. So it's something that's very useful for all performers. It, it's got to be a way of life. It is. <coughs> and therefore, even though you're not performing now, forgive me, I've got a frog in my throat. Oh, no problem. Even though you're not performing now, <coughs> the discipline that was required, that, that must, it must carry over into other aspects of your life. Absolutely. Particularly as a, as a business person. Absolutely. And this is something I tell my students, the discipline and <coughs> the work ethic mm -hmm. and the confidence that ballet instills in you yes. is something that carries over into <coughs> so many aspects of life. Mm -hmm. So, Which is, I guess, why the parents of the 300 students <coughs> have them in your class uh, to build confidence, self-confidence. Absolutely. Uh, whether they go on to have a career in dance or not. Absolutely. It's really all about helping these young girls and women become who it is that they're going to become. That does raise an interesting question. Um, how do you spot somebody who has the gift? What do you see in a, uh, in a nine-year-old, as you were? What do you see in a nine-year-old? What, what's so special about the way she moves, uh, the, the, the position of the hands, how quickly she's able to learn some of the more complicated moves? Uh, maybe I'm answering my own question, but how do you spot talent? That is something that is very hard to explain. I suppose it's like watching Cole Hamels get up yeah. and throw a ball. It's like, what is it about him yeah. that makes him so extraordinary? But like you said, you look at the God-given facility that the young dancer has. There's something about the way they move or the way they pick up mm -hmm. the steps. But I think it goes beyond that. There has to be that passion mm -hmm. and that love because that's what you need to succeed as a professional ballerina. Mm -hmm. You need to just absolutely love it and want to be there mm -hmm. and want to keep learning and growing. And every once in a while you do see a young dancer come through and there's just something about that look in her eyes when the curtain opens and yes. she sees the audience or when she masters a step or when she puts on her tutu. And you just know that mm -hmm. it's something special for mm -hmm. her. Uh, again, watching the, uh, the movie, The Red Shoes, mm -hmm. again, you, you see these things and you develop an, a, a keener appreciation for, for some of the nuances, mm -hmm. just the hand movements and the arm movements. Yes. I mean, it, it must take hours to get that down, but it, it seems so fluid and so natural when somebody who has the gift does it. Absolutely, and that's one of the funny things <coughs> that ballerinas joke about. We spend mm -hmm. hours and hours and years and years learning how to be a, a ballerina. A yes, yes, just a little move. And then when you get <coughs> on stage mm -hmm. and you see a real artist, yes. it looks effortless. Yes. And oftentimes people think ballet is easy just because ballerinas <laughs> have learned how to make it look so effortless. But it really is a lot of work. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm giggling to myself because <laughs> I'm remembering, I went to an all boys high school okay. and we put on shows. And again, we did not bring girls in to play the female roles. We okay. had, we had <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the chorus line now because these, uh, these were, really hairy Italian guys <laughs> <laughs> wearing knitted stockings and the tutus and whatnot. Oh my goodness. What, it was hilarious. I don't know why that just flashed through my mind. Talk about the, an the antithesis of what we're talking yes. about. No grace, just clumsy clods on the stage. <laughs> that must <laughs> Maybe be Maybe students like that, I don't know. Uh, not the hairy part, but well, okay. Uh, you are an entrepreneur. You pretty much made up your mind what you want to do, how far you want to go, to the extent to, what, to which you want to scale it. But where, where do you see your business three to five years from now? Well, like I said, I really see those three aspects that I talked about of my brand continuing to grow and develop. Mm -hmm. There's the <clears throat> ballet school mm -hmm. and the there's theater. 
Yes, and there's the company, Delaware yes. Valley Ballet Theater, and then there's the new brand brewing, Delaware Valley Ballet Contemporary. Mm -hmm. And it's my goal to offer every single student who mm -hmm. comes into my school the opportunity mm -hmm. to get on stage and experience that special moment of a warm and welcoming audience, yes. the lights, the costumes, what it's like to be a part yes. of a real professional full-length ballet production. So I want to just continue to grow and offer those opportunities. Hey, have you or any of your students performed at the uh, the, the uh, academy? The Academy of Music. Uh, down yes, downtown. No, we because haven't. Isn't that Pennsylvania Ballet venue now? Yes, they perform there, and there's th at the Merriam Theater, I yes. believe. So mm -hmm. maybe someday. Yes, well, I, I, I'm sure it's very expensive to yes. take the troop down. Yes. So, so where do you perform? Where is your studio? It's in Havertown, right? Our studio is in Havertown. We where have, in Havertown? It's located on Eagle Road. Where on Eagle Road? Well, you're I'm getting think you're getting me into directions, oh, and it, I'm, near, famous for, I'm famous for I'm famous for for bad directions. Oakmont? A little section called Oakmont. Rick. Eagle Road and Darby Road. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's right there. Picture. Yeah. Yes. Right. So it's right on right right on the main road. But we do not perform at the studio. It's a beautiful facility, mm -hmm. but we rent theaters mm -hmm. for the dancers. For example, just it wasn't yesterday. On Saturday, two days ago, we had our Nutcracker productions, mm -hmm. and there's 700 people in the audience. We had two wow. performances. We have. <clears throat> real backdrops we bring in a lighting designer who works with the Pennsylvania Ballet mm -hmm. we just really make it a quasi professional where, production where was that where is that that was that in King of Prussia it was at the Upper Marion Middle School mm -hmm. very close to the King of Prussia Mall about mm -hmm. a minute away mm -hmm. so. uh, there's friends of mine who have established the uh, Delaware County Performing Arts Center, Center for Performing Arts, oh, neat. in Wallingford or Swarthmore, I've forgotten mm -hmm. which. They took an old school okay. with a stage and so on. Um, and they, they created it because they said that every performing art, every choral group, every singing group, every dance group, they have a hard time finding places to rehearse and to perform. They go from fire halls to school halls and so on and so on. Uh, do you have that problem, being an itinerant uh, company? It is a challenge. You're yeah. absolutely right. And also for ballet, you need a specific theater. You need mm -hmm. a stage that accommodates the dancers, <coughs> that's safe with for them. With a special floor, right? Don't you, you have to put your own floor we down? We bring the floor. Yeah. Yes, there is a special floor. So it is a challenge to find a really excellent venue, yeah. and that's so important. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Well, you've had a storied career already. Uh, you're touching the lives of over 300 children now and their families. I can remember as a grandparent going to those recitals and suffering, I mean, enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's good for the kids. I know it is. It's good for the kids. I watched it with our, our grandchildren and talk about building self-confidence and, and, and just enjoying getting out and performing. It's, yes. it's, 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 it's an important dimension of their development. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rick. It was Best a pleasure. Of luck. Best of luck. Until next time, this is the Entrepreneurs Network. I am Rick Anthony. Take very good care of yourselves.